Hi everybody, welcome to the uh, Hudson Records Listening Club. I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you this week. My name's Sam Carter and um, this week we're going to be listening to uh, my new album which is called Home Waters which came out uh, earlier this month. So um, I'm very pleased to be here today with the producer of the album which is Ian Stevenson. Hi Ian. Hello. And uh, yeah, we're going to share with you some of the, the background to the uh, album and how it was made and uh, talk about the some of the ideas be- behind some of the songs. Um, so Home Waters was recorded um, in spring and and then in sort of mm, autumn last year. And we had kind of two different sessions that we recorded it in. Um, and uh, yeah, I... Uh, I kind of, um, yeah, I worked at the songs kind of across the course of the year as well as having written some of it before we even started, the, well, obviously before we, we started the recording process. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I wanted to do something different this time. Uh, every time I make an album, I want to kind of do something different with the, the production and the sound of it. And um, uh, my friend Jim, Jim Moray, recommended that I get in touch with Ian Stevenson, who was a great um, producer and engineer and musician, and that he'd be a good person for me to work with. So um, so I gave Ian a call, and we had a bit of a chat about the songs that I had, and I sent him some of the music, and um, uh, we hit on the idea of... Um, I kind of decided I wanted to make a sort of augmented solo record, if you like. So at the heart of the album is is my voice and guitar, Um and then uh, we decided we want to add, wanted to add some kind of uh, some, some elements to augment that, as opposed to starting with a band and kind of going, which is what I've done in the studio before. I've kind of um, arranged stuff together with a band before we started recording, and the recording process has been quite, um, quite very much a process of capturing the stuff that we've already already come up with. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, this album has been very kind of uh, string heavy. So we're going to be listening to some, hopefully some, you know, string, lush string arrangements. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really, really Ian, uh, a conversation with Ian that got me onto the idea of sort of adding these string arrangements, um, which he kind of put together so, so beautifully. Do you want to say something about the strings, Ian? Um, started? Yeah, uh, that was... Um the reason that was at the forefront of my mind when we started working together was that I'd just finished an album with um, Bill Jones, um, who's who's just done a brilliant um, kind of comeback album after not doing an album for over 15 years. Mm. And um, it, it really suited um, her stuff. And that was a similar kind of a, a, a project in the way that it was... Um, a, someone that um, plays their own music and writes their own songs, um, but that wanted to have their solo performance at the the very centre of everything and for it to be kind of adorned with extra stuff. So I'd, we'd worked with the, the the string quartet that I'd kind of pulled together from just friends of friends, and they're not a quartet that plays together regularly, although um, since then and since doing Sal, Sam's album and some other people's albums, they're playing together quite regularly, at least whenever they come to my studio. So it was... Um, it was a natural thing to suggest that, and of course, then I had some some examples that I could play to Sam so that he knew exactly um, what he was getting himself into if he agreed to the the thing. <laughs> so he'd hear my arranging style and and the type of uh, type of sounds that we're after. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, um, thanks, Ian. I think we should just crack on with the song, shall we? So let's get started. So let's start with the first track, which is called "The Forge." The sound of the smith striking down on the anvil, and I saw my name in the first. So the heart of the record is really live guitar and vocal takes, and um, all of the all of the guitar and voice was put down together as one thing. 
point um, to be as close to how I'd play it live as possible. Um, I tried, I've tried recording the parts separately, but it always seems to work better for me to have that interaction between the guitar and the voice as I would when I play at a gig. So um, you might think it would be a, a, an easy job to record a man with a guitar, but it's it's actually, um, as as the producers at Hudson Records will know, it's, it can be one of the trickiest things to get right. Uh, there's several interactions between the way this vocal microphone picks up the guitar and the guitar picks up the vocal. And, um, but it helps when you get a good, a good performer. Sam's got it. Had a good, solid voice, and he projects really well. And also because he's quite tall, his his mouth's quite a bit further from his guitar than for some people. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and also he's the volume of his guitar and playing and he's singing is is very well matched acoustically. And all of those things actually make it easier than usual um, to record him. So, yeah, it was it was an interesting point that you might think it would take a long time to set up a drum kit, but you probably you probably spent even more time getting the, the initial quality of the sound right for Sam and his guitar, with it being the most important sound on the album. Um, but then once we had it, took a bunch of photographs and then tried to keep it the same on all the tracks. Let's see if they sound the same today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From up on the hill, I yeah, it was a fun. It was fun to sort of watch all that happening. I mean, obviously, my guitar and voice has been recorded on every album I've made so far, but um, everybody's had a slightly different approach to doing that. You know, in terms of mic placement and all the rest of it. Um, now I was super pleased with the sound uh, that we got. I think I should one for the guitar geek. So I think I should show the guitar that this record was made with the acoustic. Guitar. Let into gold, I'll be down at the forge if you need me. Every true story told to So you're hearing this into gold, I'll be down at the forge. Which is my Richard Osborne uh, Dragonfly J guitar that I've been playing at every gig for the past sort of ten years now. Um, and uh, yeah, every, every every acoustic track on the record is this one. Uh, it just kind of really works. It's got a really sort of even, open kind of sound. Um, uh, you can kind of hear everything. There's not, there's not, not too many kind of wolf notes. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've just bonded with it really well over the years. I think I've figured out how to play it now, just about. <laughs> um, how do you, um, how do you exactly do you do the finger picking? So, are you using a thumb pick or a got long nails? A bit of both, yeah. So the track that we heard there, the forge, I do that one with a thumb pick, and um, that helps you to get a really good kind of driving sound on the bass um, in combination with sort of damping the bass notes um, with the palm of your hand, kind of a muted sound, you know, um, it, almost more of a, a percussive kind of oomph to it than, than the notes really um, and then on other tracks I just play with with my nails and my thumb and flesh and uh, of the thumb um, so I really kind of use it really depends on the effect that I'm going for I don't have a stock kind of I, I guess I kind of start with just my hand and then if I want to you know I'll add a pick if I want to play with a pick and I'll add a thumb pick if I want to play with a thumb pick and they all give you a slightly different set of options and, and sound um, and they're kind of all little worlds in themselves this one she brings me home um, I actually try to sort of emulate the way a banjo player plays so I'm kind of picking downwards with down strokes with the back of the nail um, and then using my ring finger on the off beats to emulate the kind of frailing sound that banjo players get it's not a frailing technique it's not the same but um, well, here we get the strings for the first time yeah here they are the home waters quartet as we we christened them because they yeah. said i said do you call yourselves anything they said you can call us whatever you want <laughs> within reason so This is also the first place that the uh, electric guitar comes in. There's, I think we only used it two or three times. Yeah. Um, try and try. 
Yeah, it's on this and um, Surprise for You and Ships in the Night. I can come yeah. to I'll rest. give you a view of that. Laser head down here on my chest. I'm all the, the, the studio where we recorded it, it's my, it's my recording studio in Northumberland, and it's, um, it's actually a kind of a small church, or it used to be, until it was converted. And, um, and so it means the room we're in is quite... Quite large. It's much, it's much bigger than a, than a recording studio will ordinarily be. And, and it meant that on a lot of these, the, a lot of these songs, we ended up not using reverb on things, and instead we just record them from further away and let the slightly churchy sound um, through. So on the electric guitars, we tended to have. Uh, Amplifier up at one end and then move the microphones really quite far back. Um, and sometimes even have more than one amp. Yeah, that was great. So that was this is what you're hearing there uh, on the slide guitar front. Um, yeah, I think that's the first time I've ever put slide guitar on a on an album. Actually, um, it's a sound that I love, but you know, one that I mean, it's, again, it's a whole discipline and world of its own. So. It's, um, yeah, fun to explore that. I love you can get quite a, you know such a vocal sound out of slide because of the, the fact you can get in between the notes as well as on the on the nose with them like you can on a regular fretted guitar style. So. This old ship is sinking. This is one of my favourites actually on the album. Fly the flag. Um, one of your politically charged ones. Yep. It's a. It's, it's got a quite a bitterness to the to the lyrics, which I really enjoy. Um, in combination with the all the extra open strings that come between the chords and create these clusters. It's um. It's about Brexit, of course. Yeah. It's the yeah. Um, I don't know how you could live through what we've lived through in the last few years and not not respond to that somehow as a as a creative person and um, Captain Box's last command shoot yeah I've just kind of where they stand to say said my two cents I guess on this but yeah the, the guitar part in this I was really pleased with it but it's kind of one of the most dissonant kind of things I've come up with I think there's some real Real kind of close clashes in the and the in the chords and fly the flag and plunder why the flag again it's the pride this is one of the first ones we did on the strings as well and when they started playing in the studio you know obviously Ian sent me initially you need to hear these kind of MIDI Sibelius you know versions of of the string arrangements and uh, you know you can hear the the notes and you get the sense of it but it sounds like robots playing music you know as midi stuff does and um yeah to go from that to hearing I remember the day we did the first set of string arrangements and the string players came in and just the sound of them tuning up and the you know kind of expertly mic'd up and it just it, it just sounded I knew it was going to be a great day the string days were some of the best the best parts of making the record really when we kind of you know, it was a lot, a lot of work for Ian getting prepared and it was a lot of kind of anticipation about what we were going to come out with because uh, it was you know something always something of an experiment when you're doing these things you know no matter how well pre well prepared you are there's always an element of what's going to actually come out on the day and um, I was blown away you know it's just fantastic so the other instrument in this track that you can hear is, yeah, really low-tuned electric guitar. I think you mentioned that, didn't you? Um, yeah, which is my my much-used Gibson hollow body, 60s hollow body guitar. I'll just grab that. That was really a, a dream of a track to uh, do the string arrangements for because there was already... The chords were already quite crunchy, which is really one of the hallmarks of my own arranging style. Um, if somebody comes up with something with very straight, functional chords, then I have to convince them to let me make them a bit more uh, ugly and dirty. But in the case of most of these songs, there was already a, 
an element of kind of uh, sourness and tension that, that was just waiting to be brought out further. And also there's, a lot, there's lots of room in song, song, songs, uh, moments of, um, of meaning and uh, little epiphany kind of moments where you could change the gear of the arrangements and things. So it was really, it was, it was great fun to, to arrange actually. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think we, I think that's one of the reasons why we, it kind of worked and why we sort of hit it off creatively is because we both really like these. You can hear on this chord here. So I've got like three three notes from the scale in the chord there that are sort of interacting in a. Um, it just gives you this kind of shimmery sort of harp-like sort of sound. That's very much part of the way I play guitar, and it's it kind of. I think it matched really nicely with the way, you know, we hit it, hit it off harmonically, didn't we, really, I think? Yeah, like the same, we like the same chords. <laughs> yeah, we like the same chords, basically. But this track, for example, you know, the strings are adding something, you know, not obviously in, in terms of the size of the sound, but extra extensions in the chords is just kind of an added quality added dimension to what's going on so just going back to the last track so fly the flag the low baritone guitar on that is is this um, which is a 60s gibson es125 um, which uh, has been sort of my main electric guitar for my solo stuff since for about 10 years now really um, i love it and it's a bit of a honky guitar it's sort of a doesn't play very evenly, um, but it just can be a bit of a pig to record sometimes, but when you get it right, it sounds really good. <laughs> the song we're listening to now, it's... Um, from every place this one um, came from the project you did, didn't it? Where there's lots of different singers were asked to arrange the song. Yeah, this is a Sandy Denny song, this one. Um, I love Sandy Denny. Uh, I got to do a project. Uh, we, we toured twice, actually, once in 2008 and then once in 2012. It was uh, um, called The Lady. It was a tour of uh, kind of big concert venues around the UK um, with some of the original members from Fairport um, as part of a sort of a house band um, with Jerry Donahue and Dave Swarbrick at the time. I got to play with Swarb. Which is really quite a thing, and um, yeah, I, uh, this was one of the songs that I sung on that tour. So I kind of, I'd always wanted to sort of record it. We also I think we should maybe Matt, stop here we? for a sec, you know, just have a little pause because we're about to go into a sort of a suite of three songs, right? So, um, uh, so the next three songs you're going to hear, um, we decided to sort of work them together as a, as a kind of. Uh, a th kind of a with a thread kind of running through them so the first song's called slow waves um and then it's followed by an instrumental called the waters meet um and on the other side of the waters meet is a song called hold back the storm so you can see where we're going i was going here with this sort of sea-based theme and with the name of the album being home waters you know um uh, and uh, the waters meet comes in the middle and kind of um unites the two as the name suggests really and so some of the the melodic and harmonic themes of both songs kind of meet together in this in this kind of transition point in the middle of the album and it goes from slow waves which is a very languid kind of well it's a song about sleep and then we go into hold back the storm which is kind of a song about climate change and um i guess one extreme to the other really emotionally so the waters meet kind of helps to make that transition and um it was something that ian brilliant you know, wrote a brilliant kind of um arrangement to bring those two those two songs together so yeah let's let's uh let's go for that so slow waves first Come, into darkness. Breathe the hidden interview. And in the way so i love the way that you can hear you know, it's so um, evocative for me of the sound of the space that we recorded this in. I know that sounds like an obvious thing in some ways, but it's not always the case with an album that it sounds like the space it was recorded in, you know. Um, 
And so that ambience that you can hear um, is, I mean, you mic the room up, right? There were two yeah. two mics further, further away from me at the back of the room, and that was kind of pretty much our reverb channel, right? Yeah. Um, so the, one of the things they do in, in classical music in order to um, kind of increase the thickness and the lusciousness of the reverb of a space that they're recording is they would record an entire orchestra with two microphones spaced apart. And these are, they're called omnidirectional because they pick up the sound from behind the performer and the sides of the room and everything. And when you space them apart, you, you kind of get twice the kind of concentration of that sound of the room do if they were on, on the single spot and sideways like this. So the, the electric guitars, Sam's voice and guitar, double bass, the string quartet, everything that we recorded at any point um, on the album, with the exception of a couple of percussion things, were recorded with this pair um, and then we could make something either feel further back or we can make it feel like the person is very much in the middle of the space. So in this one, we, we turned the pair up quite high uh, with the faders, and they were re- relatively close to, to you, Sam. So it, right. it should feel as if it gives the listener the impression that they are stood where those microphones were. So we, in this case, those mics were about... Ten feet away, away from you, and you, if you listen just for a few seconds, especially with headphones on, you can also imagine that you're there, stood in front, and that we're in this small church room together. And we'll swim. Yeah, it's a great effect, and and dream. I didn't realise how much of the sound of of my guitar I was missing from not having that extra sense of space in the recording you know with close mics you just don't you know there's a lot of information there but so much more you know um, than I've heard before so yeah, I was and the voice too I think when we mixed this one I think I wanted even more of the sound of the room than you <laughs> I was wanted like, no. <laughs> I'm drowning yeah and it's, it's too you can very nose. easily get used to the, the, the amount of reverb on a recording um, the same way if you sit in a, in a church five minutes later you're talking to someone next to you and you're not even registering that acoustic so I could very much get used to putting loads of that in the sound and, and then you might as a fresh listener come and say it's a bit too much or there's not enough so it's useful to be able to interact when we're doing the mixing yeah just on the song itself, uh, I wrote this one after I read a book called um, uh, Why We Sleep by a guy called Matthew Walker, who's a, an eminent sleep boffin and uh, has done some incredible research into sleep and its effects on the mind and the body and um, and the economy even, you know, people not getting enough of it and, um, yeah, just for some fascinating research and so uh, Slow Waves was named after the the slowest, most restful part of sleep, which is called slow wave sleep. So there we go. So now we're into uh, the waters meet, which is the the string instrumental. You'll hear the theme of slow waves, the guitar theme that Sam wrote coming back, as well as the tune of the song itself. playing from the guys here yeah superb there was um, I should say that the arrangement is that you know I can imagine how it should sound in my head and I usually imagine it that it's going to sound good because you need, you, know, you need to believe that what you're creating is going to be good before, otherwise you would get too self-critical and that can block the creative flow completely and knowing that the people that you're writing for are brilliant, reliable and that they're going to deliver the goods makes you write 
more interesting and slightly more adventurous stuff because they can even make horrible cards sound like really ace. <laughs> I also remember this day. This was the second day of string string arranging and uh, string recording. So this was in this was just early December, wasn't it? Yeah. December 2019. Um, and. Uh, know again lots of preparation lots of anticipation in spent a lot of work on the string arrangements and the day of the thing uh ian rang me up in the morning about early in the morning it's like i'm really sorry i'm so ill he was just so ill the night before and uh wasn't sure he was going to make it through the day and we were both wrecking it that uh you know how we were going to pull this together because ian's obviously engineering the sessions as well as directing the string players and I just thought how are we going to get through this um, but you rallied didn't you You, I think oh, when you heard me. it you were like oh. so you kind of it yeah. gave you a bit of a boost you know you kind of sat at the back of the control room looking sort of yeah it took a bit out. of time to wake, to wake up to it everyone was very nice and brought lots of cups of tea and <laughs> I, just, I had probably more painkillers than I ought to have had <laughs> but um, we were also helped out by the fact that the string players were very well prepared and also that um, my friend and colleague Adam Foster who's another great engineer came in and he was there as a backup mm. and mostly sat drinking Coca-Cola yeah. but if I'd have had to have left um, because yep. of being ill then that helped us also we had Ian Patterson who's a fantastic double bass player mm. came in on the recommendation to add an extra octave to some of the bits of strings on the album so he is one yeah. of the bassists that you can hear the rising tide. and the That's other right. one is your friend Matt my friend Matt Ridley we'll yeah has been my long term musical collaborator fantastic bass player and um, a writer he writes a, he's got a fantastic um, uh, kind of jazz outfit that he plays in and um, yeah but this particular track this is Ian Patterson on bass um it just gave a fantastic you know he's got a great sound they've both got great sound you know, but this um, yeah we've just added that extra dimension I guess um, loud hailers rouse the crowd the cry I guess in general there's probably less bass on this album than I've used before and it, it was kind of a nothing will drown us out of a, a realisation and a recognition of the fact that a lot of like the, the stuff I do on guitar and the tunings I play in have very low, I tune down to a, a C, there's even a B on this album, a low B, so there's not much space for a bass to occupy below that um, and it can actually get in the way of the guitar sometimes, obscure what's going on, so um, in some places we've left bass off this and let the low end of the guitar just run free <laughs> but um it's only just begun as the earth spins on in spite of all we've done it's one of the useful things about um, I always thought this bit sounds a bit too sort of Asian <laughs> I wrote this little tune as a to react to Sam's Sam's initial guitar part had a little space there and I always tried to put anything that I come up with between you'll, you'll hear that there's a little bit with a few more notes in it it's between the singing in reaction to one of Sam's guitar twiddles. What was useful with a lot of these songs was that we'd been working on them for quite a long time before we got the string parts down. So it, it, that made it a bit more intuitive to, to know where you could where you could add and where you, where you should leave something in its space. Mm. That was the same with the, the decisions on where the bass should be on some of the tracks. I think we we went and changed your mind and changed my mind on lots of different tracks mm. um, and mostly ended up let's not put bass on this mm. yeah we, I mean there was quite a, a there's quite a lot of worthwhile 
um, you know, trial and error on these on these songs. I think you know we really did work at some. I mean, this one, for example, Surprise View. There was a, we we did try a string arrangement on this, didn't we? And we yeah. we we tried it and we tried and we decided um, that it worked better without in the end. But sometimes, unless you actually hear these things, you just you know you can't you can't really know that well in advance. So um, it was it was great to have the time to actually do that on this album in a way that maybe I've not done before, at least not in the studio. Um, yeah, I remember with, with this one, um, uh, you'd, you'd said that you wanted, a, you know, something kind of simple, simple, quick string texture for this one. And that no matter what we did with it, we tried adjusting it and things, and it, it was always too much, even when yeah. it was doing pretty much nothing. And so in the end, what we did was we took one of the bits that I think that had worked and we replaced it with this electric guitar thing, which had much more of a background kind of presence. Um, whereas the strings, no matter how how reserved and, and backwards we, and smooth they played, they always felt like a strong presence on the track. Mm. Too strong. So, yeah. And I think also sometimes when a song like this has got quite an emotional chorus, you know, quite a heartfelt sort of chorus, and sometimes you can over egg that, and strings can be it can be dangerous with strings in particular because it's such a such pathos in the sound of strings that you, you know you can do you can over egg it, can't you? And so um, with this, it sounded it just went a bit it kind of just tipped over a little bit, so we brought it back. Um, I feel like it was the right call. Yeah, I agree. Um, There's not a lot of chords in this one, in, in, and they move quite quickly, which doesn't really suit itself to tension and release. Mm. So with this one, it's, you know, and the guitar's got everything in it that, that you need. Mm. Yeah, so the background guitar there is a, is a, is a Fender Strat with... Um, a lot of delay with the mix turn quite high and then two amps and then Ian's Omni mics quite far back in the room I think I don't think there's any close mics on the amp at all so it's a super kind of distant sounding and uh, sits in the background do you remember when you played that one um, I made you go into the bathroom <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so to get my sound of the the acoustic sound of the the guitar itself out of the mics I had to not be in the room that the mics were in when it recorded otherwise you got this plinky electric guitar sound over the top of the yeah the, the actual affected what we sound were, so. what we were after is not to have that initial attack to have this kind of whereas when, you, when Sam was playing the chord and fading it in with the volume control we were getting this plink wah, yeah. plink wah. <laughs> So we sent him into the, the corridor outside the hall. Many years since I've been sent to the corridor. Yeah. It felt very... Uh, yeah, surprise for you. So that's a song about... Um, uh, well, it's kind of set in the Peak District, which is close to where I now live in Sheffield. And, um, yeah, it's about a beautiful viewpoint there and about a guy going to, to kind of um, stand in the spot where he remembers his his deceased uh, wife and walking partner of many years most vividly so this is Grenfell Road How do we move on? I feel like we should talk a bit less in this one Sam we end up <laughs> now we have no hope now we have no Promise broken, months have come and gone. So, where will we end up now? We have no hope. Now we have no hope. Cause it seems at best we've been left for dead. Sleeping for a breath 
rest in this hotel bed Come on, look at us It's not good enough Just to bow your head song yeah great playing from the string players there really great yeah nice moment in the middle from Mark Carroll who plays the cello in the ensemble Matt Ridley on double bass on that one yeah okay so we've we've come to the last track already so this is Ships in the Night uh, which is a song about missing your pals and uh, reminiscing of you know good times you've had in the past it's good Quite relevant today. Yeah, it's it's been funny singing this one recently, particularly on the lockdown album launch I did. You know, just thinking it's going to be fun when we get to hang out again. You know, in real life. So, um, this is another one with a electric guitar at one end of the room and yeah, guitar again. We had to fight to make sure we it couldn't hear some sounds of growing stick. We had a we had quite a demoitis uh, experience with this song, which is that at the end of the first session that we did in in spring, um, I had a kind of rough idea for this track, and we just shut down some ideas really quickly at the end of the day, just to sort of to have something recorded, and um, so I just played played the electric and sang the song a bit and mumbled some words didn't have all the words at that point and uh, Ian just chucked down these really heavy sort of compressed drums just kind of got not a kit but a bass drum and uh, I think it was a floor time wasn't it and then a yeah. snare and and, a, and um, a tambourine and it was beautifully kind of loose and messy because you know it was really hard to play in time if you if I put this free guitar down you know um but there was something lovely about it. Um, but then trying to capture that free sound again once you've finished the lyrics and you you know go back and it's a classic problem. Um, we almost to... decided to keep the original at one stage. But yeah. There was just the looseness was good in one way, and then there was there was parts of the performance we would have liked to have changed that we just couldn't. Well, some of the lyrics were just m- literally just mumbles. There was nothing. So. Yeah, it's tricky. But I feel like we got there in the end. We, the, re, the way we got there is that we completely tired ourselves out trying to capture it. And in the end, at the end of the day, we're like, oh, let's just try one more time. And I was so tired. I think we just got that. We were overthinking the feedback it that we originally well. had. Yeah, we were overthinking it. Um, so the setup yeah. for this one was, was, was quite interesting. The, the, the floor tom. It's a floor tom, an enormous floor tom that belongs to Adam, most of my colleague. Um, it's, it must be like a 21 inch, 24 inch floor tom. It's a big heavy metal thing. Um, so it was this hit with a beta and with an omni microphone, which brought up the real deep sun lights about an inch from the skin. And really hitting it fairly loosely, fairly quietly, and then boosting that sound so you get more of a sustain out of it. The guitar was mic from the other side of the room. Leave it so long. Let's not leave it so long next time. And then harmonium. Oh, harmonium, yeah. I've got yeah. harmonium on. Yeah. It's actually an American reed organ. 
for the oh. organ enthusiasts out there. There we go. Well, and that brings us to the end of the the record. So um, thanks so much for listening. I mean, I guess I've just, in closing, you know, told you a bit about the, the kind of whole concept of the album itself. And the idea was that it was, um, or it became an album about finding some kind of sense of being anchored and a sense of belonging uh, in a time of uncertainty. And I guess that had a resonance for me personally because I recently moved from um, from London to Sheffield. So I'd kind of moved into a kind of new world and new stage of my life. And at the same time, you know, I don't need to recount the things that have been going on for us sort of nationally and internationally and, um, uh, you know, over, over that period from 2016 onwards to now. And um, it's just felt like a very unsettling time. And so I guess I've been thinking a lot about what actually what can we rely on? What kind of anchors us? What keeps us steady, you know, in these bizarre times that are going on uh, personally and in, in the wider world? And I guess in the album, some of the songs are kind of answers to that question, like She Brings Me Home, for example. Um, you know, the the idea being, you know, the people close to us can can give us that sense of belonging. But some of the some of the songs are more questions or more sort of wrestling with the this this kind of uncertainty like I think fly the flag and like hold back the storm where songs are a bit more about the turbulence that we experience as well you know the storm as well as the the calm that you can you can find somehow and um so yeah I think that's kind of what the album is about trying to find some kind of anchor point and then um you're very lucky that um a friend of mine or now a friend of mine but somebody I, I met in the process of doing this record um John Pedder, he's a great artist based in Sheffield who drew this fantastic, maybe uh, Andy can put the, uh, the the cover up on the, sh- the screen at this point. But um, yeah, um, it's kind of like a little guy in a paper boat kind of out on the sea. And he's got his hands open like this. It's almost, sometimes when I look at it, he's kind of going, come on, do your worst, come on. You know, he's kind of um, defiantly kind of dealing with the ups and downs of life. In other days, he's just like, oh, just let's get over this already <laughs> you know so it depending on my mood um uh it can go either way and that's kind of how i f- feel about the album that there's both there's you know there's 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 uh there's light and 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 shade in in the album you know and uh and hopefully that comes across and um and i think you know, I'm really grateful to Ian. I've said it's to you now on record Ian. i'm so grateful for you kind of taking up the challenge of the songs and the really taking the time to get into how they work and you know what what was trying to be expressed in the songs because i think so often you people just hear hear it as a mu- you know obviously it is music but when you're trying to hear the message and and to kind of help that be conveyed i think you just did a really great job of of helping those the songs kind of come through and um yeah so thanks a lot it was it was great i really enjoyed it and um yeah, I hope, hope you, everybody here has enjoyed listening to this, us rambling on. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, and the record's out now. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Uh, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. And thanks to Hudson Re- Records for asking yes. us to do this. It was really nice to be asked. Thanks so much to Andy Bell um, for making this, creating this whole um, forum for us to chat to you on. And uh, thanks for inviting me on and to be uh, to be a guest on the the listening club. All right. Cheers. Enjoy your weekend. Bye. Bye.